Warning, listener discretion is advised. You guys, I am convinced that every year Earth tries to kill us with winter. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are going to talk about trying the cocaines, taking the pots, doing the pills. <laughs> Today's episode is about drugs. <laughs> and I'm going to share some quick updates about what's going on in my life. But first, let's pay some bills. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, I need to share all kinds of stuff with y'all. First, one of my favorite aunts on earth was diagnosed with brain cancer last Monday, and I didn't find out about it until Thursday or so, and my heart is broken, guys. This great aunt on my dad's side was the, her and my great grandmother on my dad's side were the first two people on that side of the family to look into my little eyes as a child and say, Oh, that's David's baby. And they were the first people on that side of the family to make me feel validated, like I belonged. And, you know, I think this is what I think the story is from what I've been told over the years. But my great grandmother and my Aunt Pat used to own this um, gas station in Abilene. And. My mother used to go in and out of there all the time. Like, she was kind of a regular. It was close by the house or whatever. Something like that. And, you know, they would notice my mom coming in and out. And they would notice, you know... I think that it had gotten around that, you know... The girl that my dad was seeing at the time was, you know, that girl. The girl that, you know, was coming into the gas station all the time. And... You know, they noticed her getting big, and then they noticed that, you know, she wasn't big anymore, and then they one day they finally asked her, like, hey, did you just have a baby? My mom said, yeah, he's a few months old now, and I think at this point I was like a, a year, pushing a year or so, and I was like a, a year and a few months probably, and, you know, they're like, well, can we see him? You know, your what does he look like? It is you know, all of that stuff. They were basically just trying to get a good look at me. And uh my mom brought me in one day and you know, my great grandmother and my great aunt Pat, they you know, looked into my face and they both you know they both looked at my mother and said, That's David's baby. And at that point, my dad completely denied he was the dad, he was the father. Sometimes to this day, he'll say, I'm not even your real dad, <laughs> like a fucking piece of shit. And, um, you know, my, my great aunt and my great grandmother completely convinced, just looking into my eyes for two seconds, they're like, that's David's baby. And if I'm not mistaken, there was, um, you know, a few months later, there was this big family get together at one of at either great grandma's house or my aunt Pat's house. And my aunt Pat invited my mother and I, we get there and everyone's like, who's this bitch and this baby? Who, who the fuck are these people at this family gathering? And, and people would ask my great grandmother and she'd say, that's my grandbaby. People would ask my aunt Pat and she would say, that's my nephew. And, you know, finally, my Aunt Pat had convinced my grandmother, David's mother, and my grandpa, David's stepdad, who I consider my grandpa, um, Teresa and Reuben, to go meet me. And, you know, my grandmother was very much on my dad's side. If my dad said that the sky was red, she's like, ooh, the sky's red. If my dad said, that's not my baby, my grandma was like, that's not his baby. At that point, anyway. And finally, I'm two years old at this party at this point, and my my aunt Pat convinces them to go over there. They go over there, and I'm in like these cute little <laughs> I'm in these cute little overalls. She says, and I'm wearing these fucking little sandals. I swear to God, I look retarded. <laughs> Those like brown sandals that look like grandma sandals that. You know, she beats you with. 
anyway, and my hair is parted, you know, just right, and it's, you know, I'm looking cute for this little thing, and my grandmother Teresa looks at me for, like, the same two seconds it took my great-grandmother and my aunt Pat, her sister, and her mother, and she says, that's David's baby. <laughs> but I'll always have a special place in my heart because... Uh, for my aunt Pat, because she, you know, she she was the first one to c- completely convinced that I was I was David's son and that I belonged, and you know, if not for my aunt Pat, I probably would not have ever known that side of the family. Or f- for the good and the bad, I you know would not have been at, at all involved, and you know my grandparents might never have accepted me and. My dad might not ever have accepted me or anything like that, but finding out about my great aunt Pat really, really broke my heart. I was a mess for the for the next two days after finding out, but that's going on right now. Uh, next week I will be in Abilene visiting her, so I'm probably not going to have an episode up, which is why I'm doing a Monday episode this week and a Thursday episode this week. It sounds like I got through that without crying, but it's really because I edited everything out. It's a pretty rare form of cancer, and we've been blessed to, you know, have access to a pretty good team of doctors to take care of her and stuff. But, um, especially in a time right now where a lot of people are worried that their health care might be completely stripped away from them because of the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. A lot of people in the country right now are worried about their health care being stripped away from them or, you know, them being dropped from their health care because they have pre-existing health conditions which are no longer protected because of the eventual rescission of Obamacare depending on which way the court sways. And in a 6-3 to three conservative majority, a lot of people's civil rights are at stake right now. We have voting rights for African Americans. We have the right to marriage for LGBT people. We have a woman's right to choose what the fuck goes on in her body. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk too seriously about abortion right now because I have my own personal feelings about abortion. But I also know that my personal feelings about abortion don't get to decide what some lady that I'm never gonna meet in Montana does with her uterus. To a clump of cells that I'm never going to meet. Like Anyway, it's very complex, <laughs> the decisions I've made about abortion in my head. But one thing that I do know is that as a man, it doesn't fucking matter what I think. You know what I mean? And I wish more people thought that way. Anyway, that's going on right now. <laughs> I kind of went on a tangent, but I was talking about how blessed my family is to get have a good team of doctors treating her. But um, as well as things might be. I I still was moved to do whatever I could to support financially whatever care she would need. So if you go to my Facebook or I did I share it on Twitter? I don't know. I'll share it on Twitter and I'll share it on Instagram. If you go to those social media platforms, I've put together a raffle where if you donate five more than five dollars, For every um, unit of $5 you donate, your ticket will be added to a drawing. And after the GoFundMe reaches its goal, I will draw a ticket. And whoever wins the raffle will get a free painting of mine, whichever, whichever one you want. And I have a good collection so far. And then I will paint you whatever the fuck you want. (laughs) And that's just to kind of help my aunt out you know, further. And there's that. My mother's getting married on Halloween and (laughs) I'm going to say it here on the podcast. (laughs) So no one can say that I wasn't real about it, but I don't know (laughs) if this marriage is going to work out only because I know my mother. I've known my mother for 24 years, 25, 25 years already. God damn. I've known (laughs) my mother at her worst. I've known my mother at her best. And my mother isn't the type of woman that you marry. (laughs) My mother isn't the type of woman that likes being told what to do. Not that women lose autonomy during marriage, but even at that, my mother's not the marrying type. (laughs) She she isn't the kind of woman you make a wife. (laughs) And 
God, I love them both to death, but they're both terrible with money. <laughs> and, you know, her man is kind of quiet and reserved, which completely makes sense to me because my mother is not. She's very domineering and strong and independent. And she <laughs> maybe you know what? Maybe this marriage is going to work out. <laughs> maybe everything is going to be just fine because strong people normally have someone to mellow, mellow them out or even them out. <laughs> that's mellow. And, you know, <laughs> in thinking about it, they are kind of polar opposites in that way. But uh, my mother's getting uh, married this weekend and it's at four o'clock on Saturday. So I have to drive to New Mexico on Saturday to, you know, be at my mother's wedding or whatever. And then I have to drive all the way to Abilene and I'm going to spend some time with my great aunt uh, in Abilene. And then the election is on Tuesday, so I'm probably going to stay in Abilene Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, come back to Hereford on Tuesday. And then I, you guys, I have decided that I am going to be a, an honorary Uber for anybody in the city of Hereford that needs a ride to the polls. So if you live in Hereford and you're not going to be able to make it to the polls because you don't have a ride or someone's parked behind you at work and you're not going to be able to move your vehicle and you need someone to take you find me on facebook find me on twitter message me snap me figure it out i will pick you up take you to the polls drop you off at back at wherever you are and carry on with my life and if you live in america and you live in a city that i can't reach reasonably reach you i will pay for an uber to go out pick you up, drop you off at your polling station and take you back home if it's not, you know, too crazy. But um, it's really important, you guys, that you get out there and you vote. Our democracy is depending on it. I know that every election cycle you hear that and it's, you know, sounds cliche at this point. <laughs> it sounds like we're beating a raw horse, but it really, this one is like something that I've never seen or studied before the integrity of the soul of our nation really does balance on whether the american people can tell people can see the forest for the trees it's we're at a crucial time in history and i know that i'll always be able to say that i stood on the right side of that but i don't want any of you listening to wake up one day and know in your heart that you could have done more, or you could have spoken louder, or you could have been moved to act and didn't. Anyway, moving on, <laughs> today's episode is about drugs. I, <laughs> I've i had a rocky history with drugs because um, I was diagnosed ADHD at eight years old. And at eight years old, I was given Ritalin for a little bit. And then at nine, I was switched to Adderall. <laughs> and as a nine-year-old, I was given 20, or maybe it was 15 or so, 15 milligrams of um, Adderall <laughs> every single day. And it started not to work as well. <laughs> and Adderall, for people who aren't, ADHD is basically speed. It's this it's adjacent almost the exact same chemical compound as speed. And for people who do have ADHD, it kind of, you know, helps us focus, mellows us out. Have you ever seen that movie Limitless? It's basically that drug. And at nine years old, I was given fifteen. 15 every single day, 15 milligrams. And I would take it and I could not sleep. I couldn't sleep to save my life. So this doctor just said, Oh, I will give him clonidine at night, which is a blood pressure medication to even him out a little bit. So that way, you know, the Adderall will wake him up, get him focused for the day. And then at the end of the night, when he can't put himself to sleep because he's on a, <laughs> he's on crack, <laughs> the, Blood pressure medication will lower his blood pressure so much that it'll literally knock him out and he'll be able to get some rest. <laughs> and that happened every single day, 
even on the weekends for literally my entire educational existence, my, my entire educational situation, like from like third or yeah, third grade to the day I graduated high school, I was taking those medications every single day and every few years or so the dosage that was being given to me would not work anymore, so they would have to up it, and then for a year or two, it would work just fine, and then eventually I would create... My body would, you know, build a a resistance to that set amount, and I would be upped again, and then when I was 16, with all of these drugs already in my body, I, I started popping pills like a dumbass. I was getting them them I was getting them from other depressed kids at school. <laughs> and I was getting them from I was getting them from anyone I can get my hands on them from. But I was taking Xanax and Valium and and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And, you know, with my already fortified immunity and, and resistance to certain drugs nothing was working for me and uh, over years and years and years of me popping pills all through high school I started building a resistance to those drugs and now almost zero drugs affect me you can give me all kinds of stuff you can give me a cocktail that would probably kill somebody and I take a quick nap for 30 minutes and I'm fine (laughs) which is no laughing matter if you start experimenting with uh, with prescription drugs, get help because it's not fun. Anyway, 16, I go into a mental rehabilitation facility and they're trying to give me things and I tell them, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, this doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work. And it literally got to the point where they were almost giving me tranquilizers to to mellow me out and get my levels correct because everything else that they had in their arsenal of prescription drugs was just not working. And I think that, I think that afterwards I kind of mellowed out. Whenever I graduated high school, I decided I wasn't going to take medications anymore, which is dangerous because after years and years and years of having these drugs in my system, not only had I become chemically dependent on on Adderall for focusing and clonidine for sleeping, but I'd also had this resistance and my brain was completely wired different now because certain neurotransmitters weren't needed anymore and certain neurotransmitters were pumping out over time and and my my whole kind of brain was my whole brain was kind of fucked up and normally you know those news stories that you see where it's like psychotic lady drowns her kids and slits her husband's throat when he gets home. You know, you know, like the Andrea Yates story. You see those stories and you're like, "Wow, what was this? What was wrong with this lady?" It's normally because they quit their normal prescribed drug schedule for like two days, and their brain goes completely insane. And then they drown their children in the tub and kill their husbands. Which, when I turned 18, I decided to completely quit all of my medications cold turkey. Which is a very brave thing to do, and I say that with humility, because it's killed people before. But I I looked into myself and I decided that I didn't want to live and walk through the rest of the days of my life with a crutch. And that if I was going to exist, I was going to do so on my on my own terms and with my own will, which I knew was strong because up to that point I'd managed to survive. And so I stopped taking all of the drugs that I'd been prescribed. At one point I'd been prescribed at least like six or eight different drugs. Six, yeah, six or eight different drugs. And I just stopped all of them. I wasn't taking anything. I wasn't even fucking taking allergy medication, (laughs) which I needed very badly (laughs) because I'm allergic to winter. (laughs) And even though I love it, I love winter when I'm inside looking out and when I'm like, you know, dressing up and going to check the mail. That's cute. But if I am 
driving in the winter time, if I am walking or, you know, existing outside for extended periods of time, I am livid. I hate being outside in winter. I like being inside in winter. <laughs> winter is my favorite season because, you know, I'm I'm a hot person. I've said this before. I will start sweating sitting outside in a t-shirt and shorts on the porch in wintertime. <laughs> There's this joke in my family that, oh, you're sweating like a whore in church or Fonzie in a well-air-conditioned room. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I've always liked the wintertime because I'm just a hot person in general. And, ah, oh, damn, I like wintertime because it's nice and cool and it's fresh and I'm not so sweaty all the time. And I can actually wear clothes that kind of enable my body dysmorphia in a way and I can hide all of the things that I don't like about myself with the types of clothes that I wear during wintertime. And, you know, everything's great. Love wintertime. But there's just some days where I'll wake up and I'm like, why is the earth trying to kill me? <laughs> I am convinced that the earth sends wintertime <laughs> to try and kill us all, like flies or mosquitoes and spiders. And for whatever reason, as human beings, we just evolved to not have to do any of that shit. We, we we evolved to not die during winter time. We evolved to not need to hibernate for six months like fucking bears and shit. You, we discovered fire and all that other bullshit was over with. And then every every year the earth just gets summer sp winter time just gets a little bit worse to, so that Mother Nature can see if she can end us all or something. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> back to drugs. <laughs> and, you know, as an adult, I was popping painkillers here and there. I would, you know, if I was having a really rough day and I just couldn't sleep, I would, you know, take a hydrocodone and drink a glass of whiskey. And uh, Prescription drugs were always my vice when it came to drugs. I wasn't a big weed smoker in high school. <laughs> One, because I had this preconceived notion that um, pot smoking made you the kind of person that didn't succeed and that's not a very good that's not a very good thought to have as an educated person but I wasn't educated about anything other than what <laughs> the education system at the time wanted me to know and at the time they try to scare you into thinking that people who abuse drugs or use drugs are abusing drugs and then people that abuse drugs don't amount to anything which is false because there are plenty of high functioning people in the world that can you know smoke pot every day i'm not advocating that anybody go out there and smoke pot every day <laughs> but i'm also not saying that it's any of my fucking business if you decide to do that or not i just in high school was completely convicted with the fact that I was not going to do that because people that don't become anything do that. And of course, as I've told you before, I was on this mission at a young age to be something. So I didn't fuck with weed. <laughs> I actually didn't even end up trying weed. I <laughs> trying weed. I didn't even try smoking the pots until I think I was 19. <laughs> that New Year's New Year of 2014, 15, one of those years, New Year's 2014, 14 or 15, one of those years, I had been invited to a friend's New Year's Eve party, and these friends that I'd made, one, I made friends very quick, and two, <laughs> I knew these friends were pot smokers because they were who in high school they were the people that I got the pills that I would pop in high school from and anyway so I'm invited to this party and I'm not going to say any other names <laughs> because they're probably still heavily involved with drugs 
but they were, you know, they were the kids I wanted to be around here and there. Like they weren't my group, but because my group could be anybody, I kind of, you know, when I was with this group of people, I assimilated into their culture, (laughs) if that makes sense. And became one of them for the time that I'd spend with them. And one, uh, I have, I've always had this rule. I've always had this rule that, you know, if I'm drinking, if I'm at a party and I'm drinking and someone pulls out weed, pulls out weed, you stay on that side of the house or the room. I'll sit and sip my alcohol on this side of the house and that, or the room and everything's good. Like, you know, if we're outside in a garage or something... I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing, you stay on your side, I'll stay on my side, everything's fine. The second someone pulls out cocaine, I'm leaving. (laughs) The second someone pulls out a hardcore drug, I'm leaving. That was always my rule. Well, (laughs) at this particular party, I think a boy that I'd been obsessed with for a few years, probably since my junior year, had been at that party, and my friend that was a chick <laughs> in this group of of delinquents of juvenile delinquents had um offered me marijuana and i you know was t- <laughs> I, I i i don't know what it was but he was smoking this guy so i was like yeah i'm not a little bitch <laughs> and i tried it and i but i told them it was my first time and all of that other good stuff and they're like oh no you're going to be fine we're going to take care of you everything's going to be good mind you i'd already been drinking and i'd you know been feeling not buzzed not tipsy not drunk but you know i was feeling good it was starting to work its way into me and i have a high tolerance for alcohol as well cuz i'd been drinking since i was like 14 and because everyone, everyone's parents has like a bottle of alcohol laying around and everyone, everybody finds the vodka and takes all the vodka out, replaces all the vodka with water and then drinks that. <laughs> everybody does it. And I'd been doing that for a, for a while. So alcohol had zero effects on me. And <laughs> because of this superhuman resistance to drugs that I'd built over the, you know, over the years, over my entire lifespan. And anyway, so this girl that I'm hanging out with, she's like, hey, do you want some of the pots? And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. It's my first time, though. I've never had the pots before. <laughs> and she's like, oh, no, you're going to be okay. She's like, do you want to try it from this pipe, or do you want to hit the bong, or do you want to, like, whatever. Anyway, this guy that I'm obsessed with is ripping the bong, or whatever you call that. And I'm like, uh, the bong. <laughs> Trying to, like, impress him, or something like that. I don't know why. <laughs> I'd already hit that at that point, so I didn't know what else I was trying to accomplish. I I don't know. I thought that if he saw me as someone that he could hang out with, he might want to be... I don't know. I don't know what the problem was. But (laughs) anyway, I end up hitting the bong a, a few, like once or twice, and, you know, I'm they're like, oh, damn, dude, like, that was a lot, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. They asked me that two seconds after hitting it. One, I'm trying not to cough my lungs out, (laughs) because that boy's right there. (laughs) And then, you know, uh, her and my other friends were like, "Uh, dude, are you, are you chill? Are you all right? I'm like, yeah. Anyway, for like two seconds, (laughs) I'm fine. I'm a perfect perfectly normal human being and then we're all like standing in the kitchen and for whatever reason I noticed that like five minutes ten minutes had gone by and I'm just like on autopilot I didn't hear a word they were saying and then (laughs) I'm leaning against the refrigerator and (laughs) in the middle of a conversation I just slide down to the ground (laughs) <laughs> and everyone's like, dude, are you okay? Because everyone's watching me. They know what's going to happen. They knew it was my first time. And I'm crossfaded because I'd already started drinking. And then I took two big hits of what I would later find out was dro, Which, 
according to the pothead friends that I'd had, was pretty strong shit for someone who's trying the pots for the first time. <laughs> to this day, I'm like, whose fucking idea was that? Anyway, so I'm on the ground for two seconds, and I'm like, oh, I have to use the restroom because I'm feeling my body doing a thing. I don't know what it was, but my body was doing a thing. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to the restroom real quick. And everyone's like, dude, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. And I'm crawling on all fours to the restroom from the kitchen. Anyway, I get to the restroom and I'm in there for like 10 minutes trying to figure life out. I end up throwing up all of the, all of the, like, I think it was Smirnoff or something that I was drinking or uh, margarita or vodka mix with Sprite. I don't know what it was, but I would just drink, been drinking all night <laughs> and I throw all of that up. At least I think it's all of it. And then... You know, I'm still feeling disgusting because finally the pots is kicking in. <laughs> finally, it's all kicking in and stuff. And I remember, like, the the world was spinning faster than it normally was. And I was getting dizzy and it was making me throw up more. So I was like, uh, what do I do? And then I finally just laid on the ground and I was throwing up. <laughs> While I was laying on the ground, half of my face is in vomit. The other half of my face is covered in tears because I'm crying because I think I'm dying. <laughs> I, I've decided at that point that I was dying. Like, this is this is it for me. I'd never been that. Uh, I thought at that point that I was just super drunk, but I wasn't. It was the pots making me feel super drunk because I was crossfaded. And so I think I'm going to die. I'm at this point, I'm convinced I'm going to die and I'm in there for like an hour <laughs> in and out of sleep, in and out of crying <laughs> in on the restroom floor, in my throw up singing chandelier and hitting every single note. <laughs> I'm on the ground crying, singing chandelier in my throw up. And then my, my friend, the girl, she knocks on the door because it's her fucking house. And she lives, she lived in a trailer outside of town at this point. And she's like, dude, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. And I'm totally not all right. And then she says, well, I gotta pee, and it's the only restroom in the house, and I'm like, oh no, that's fine, you can go ahead, and while I'm still on the ground facing the tub, which is across from the toilet, I'm in my tears and my throw up singing Chandelier and that Stay High song by um, Tovlo, <laughs> hitting every note. She's behind me peeing, and I'm just, like, closing my eyes and throwing up and crying and <laughs> and singing. And she's like, are you okay? Do I need to get you out of here? Do you need a blanket? Do you need... And I was like, you can just give me a blanket. <laughs> and I was like, don't give me one that you like, though. <laughs> so she gave me, like, one of, her, one of the blankets that she normally wraps her dog's thing in or whatever, but she just washed it. And I was like, this is fine. This is great. Thank you so much. You're my favorite. Thanks. And she's like, are you okay? Do I need to take you home? Do you want to go to the hospital? At this point, those laws had just been passed where if someone was, you know, in the middle of like an alcoholic poisoning or something, you could take them to the hospital and they could be treated and files wouldn't, uh, charges couldn't be pressed. You wouldn't get in trouble. They would, even if you were a minor, they would treat you and then they would send you on your way. They No questions asked. If you were 14, getting your stomach pumped, nothing would happen. You'd be, you'd be completely safe and clear. Those laws had just passed. So she was like, do you need me to take you to the hospital? And I was like, I'm not a little bitch. <laughs> Is so-and-so, the, the boy I was obsessed with. Is he still here? And she said, no, <laughs> he left. <laughs> anyway, so I'm like pissed because I didn't get to be cool and flirt with him. And, you know, I end up falling asleep in my throw up and my tears singing chandelier on the restroom floor and I end up falling asleep I'm in there all night I wake up in the morning that boy I'm obsessed with comes back he's asleep on the 
on the living room couch, and there were two couches in the living room facing each other on opposite, you know, walls. And so I fall asleep on the other one, thinking in my head, when he wakes up, he's going to see me, and I'm going to be looking real cute. <sighs> and we're going to be looking real cute, and then he's going to fall in love with me, and we're going to live happily ever after. Didn't happen. I was I was asleep. I woke up, and he was gone. And so that was the end of that. But <laughs> I didn't feel like a normal human being for at least two days after that. And then I told myself, I'm never touching the pots again. I'm never touching the pots again. And I didn't hang out with those friends for a while because of that. <laughs> I think I was, I only had myself to be mad at, but I was convinced that it was their fault for giving me Dro my very, very first time of trying the pots. <laughs> And so that's how my first experience with uh, marijuana turned out. And years later, I'm working at Taco Bell and I'm the general manager of the store. My assistant manager, whose name I will not share on the podcast, she is telling me she's my night assistant manager. Well, she's my first assistant manager. And then I get another one who's in the morning shift and then this girl decides, this night shift girl decides not to be my assistant manager anymore. And then I get a different nighttime assistant manager. But this girl, this first girl that I'm talking about, she was my very first assistant manager. So <laughs> my assistant manager tells me, you know, oh, I want to go home and smoke the weeds. <laughs> and I tell her, oh, I'm cool. You can tell me like I'm, I'm not a narc or anything. I'm, I'm not a. I'm not a, I'm I'm not a snitch. I'm I'm cool. I I can hang. And she's like, Yeah, I want to go home and smoke. I go home and, and I'm like, You go, you smoke the pots. And she's like, I I smoke the pots every day. And I was like, Wow. And she's like, Have you ever smoked in the pots? And I told her, one time. And then I told her the entire story. And she's like, Hmm. And then I always end that story with, and I've never touched it since. <laughs> I know what my vices are, smoking, alcohol, pills, that's my thing. And at this time, uh, on occasion, I'm still popping pills. Now, I'm not. But at this certain time, I, I'd still pop a hydrocodone here and there if I needed, like, if I was being dramatic. <laughs> and she told me, well, maybe the wrong person smoked you out. And then in my brain, I decided, actually, that sounds like a, that, that sounds like you have a point there. <laughs> that actually does sound right. Because there's got to be something amazing about smoking the pots if everyone does it and risks like 40 years worth of prison for half a joint in a pipe. <laughs> it's got to be amazing. Maybe I was just doing it wrong. And she said, yeah, maybe the wrong person smoked you out. After we're done with inventory and we're done with closing and we're done with everything, we we can go to my house and smoke the married iguanas. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and <laughs> so we close the store. We get everything ready to go. And then we, we go to her house. We, yeah, 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 yeah. I drive over to her house after I get changed out of my clothes and all of that good stuff. And then, you know, she has the married iguanas ready. She has it all grinded up in that little thing that looks like a, like a pepper shaker. And, you know, everything's ready to go. I, <laughs> being a nerd and being excited, like, oh, I'm finally going to try the married iguanas that won't kill me. <laughs> I put together a, like a, like a, like a pot smoking uh, music playlist on Spotify. <laughs> and I named it songs to get twisted to <laughs> like a fucking, like a fucking, fucking nerd. <laughs> I put the, I put the playlist on and then me and her <laughs> start getting, start smoking the married iguanas. And I ask her after I've already taken a good amount of hits. Like, I don't think this is working. And she's like, well, are you inhaling? And I was like, I think so. At that time, I've already been smoking a good amount of uh, cigarettes. <laughs> so I, I guess I don't know when I'm inhaling smoke or not because I'd gotten used to it at that point. And so I'm smoking marijuana. <laughs> I'm, I'm hitting the pipe like, 
fucking Snoop Dogg at this point, and I don't know that I'm smoking as much as I am. <laughs> and, you know, we finished the bowl. <laughs> we finished the bowl. And she's like, how are you feeling? And I was like, I feel fine. And then two seconds after that, I am laughing for five minutes straight for no reason. She, we're not telling jokes. The music has stopped playing at this point. It's supposed to be quiet in this house because there's other people living there and sleeping there. Her family's asleep, and I'm just laughing for no reason. And then I'm and mostly because her face, like, <laughs> while she's examining how high I am or whatever, and I'm, I'm laughing my head off. And I laugh for five minutes, and then for ten minutes, I am so paranoid. I am convinced that the FBI is listening in on my phone <laughs> and recording receipts for when I become president someday, and they use that recording as blackmail to get what they want, <laughs> for me to, like, start a war or something. And so I'm, like, telling everyone, I'm telling her, and at that time, her girlfriend, that sh they need to take the batteries out of their phone and turn the TV off and unplug it, and I'm paranoid. And then after that, I start getting so nauseous. And she's like, maybe it's because you're thirsty. I have cotton mouth too right now. And she had all kinds of snacks in this room, just chilling, ready to go, because, like I said, she gets high all the time. And she hands me a Capri Sun, and <laughs> she almost puts the straw in for me, and I throw a fit, because I'm a big boy, and I need to do it myself. It takes me, like, three minutes to put the fucking straw in the Capri Sun. <laughs> she finally does it for me. And I'm drinking the Capri Sun, laying on her bed, trying not to die. Because I already feel like I just can't handle myself. But I end up not throwing up this time. I just feel like I'm dying the whole time. And I keep telling myself, like, why do people like this? <laughs> all, all while I'm, like, psychoanalyzing the decisions I've made, like, <laughs> breaking down how my shitty childhood led me to this point. <laughs> and so I'm like dying. I'm nauseous. I feel like throwing up. I, I, I never end up throwing up that night, but I'm just nauseous as all hell. I can't even walk straight. Uh, my assistant manager and her girlfriend, who is also the cousin of my best friend, are <laughs> they have to walk me into their car on both shoulders like I'm like a fucking like I'm saving private Ryan or some shit <laughs> and they put me in the car and I shit you not I am in the front seat because I get nauseous in the back seat so I know it's gonna make me worse and I'm telling them I have to go to the front the front seat and they're like we can't we can't put you in the front seat you're gonna throw up and I was like I'll throw up even worse if you put me in the back seat so they put me in the front seat and I'm in the front seat, and I feel like throwing up. And we haven't even pulled out the driveway. So <laughs> there's nothing to throw up into. And she's like, you better not fucking throw up in my car, dude. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we are across town from my house. Not my house, my home. And, and so I decided that I am going to let her drive me across town with the fucking passenger door cracked open and my head hanging over the street. So it, just in case I throw up, I could throw up on the street while she's driving. Dramatic is all kinds of fuck. <laughs> we finally, uh, driving 10 miles an hour across town, finally get to, to my place and they have to walk me inside again. And this is how you know these were good duties because they you know, get me inside, I get inside, I get in bed, and I have everything I need, like, they put everything out for me, a trash can, all that good stuff, a towel, you know, for my mouth or whatever, and everything's good, I wake up the next morning, <laughs> and I tell myself, for real, for real this time, I'm never smoking the pots again, <laughs> I'm allergic, 
<laughs> I'm I I'm the only person on earth allergic to the married iguanas. I'm never touching it again. I know where my limits are. I can pop a million pills. I can drink half a bottle of alcohol and be fine. I can't take just a little bit of the weeds. Oh, or I'll die. <laughs> So that's my marijuana. Uh, that's so that's my married iguana story. To this day, when I get offered pot, I will, <laughs> I will respectably <laughs> decline <laughs> their offer, and I will tell them the story. <laughs> and it's always hilarious. Everyone thinks that I'm just the funniest fucking thing that I almost died two times, smoking the the pots, trying the weeds, <laughs> and then. Okay, yeah. So those that was the first, those were the two times that I, that I've tried weed and I I have never and I will never do crack or crystal meth or meth or heroin or any of that stuff, <laughs> but but I have tried cocaine before. I know I don't look like the kind of person that would try the cocaines, but I did. <laughs> Let me tell you all that story. I have some friends in Amarillo. They are two gay gentlemen. They are... I love them. They're adorable. <laughs> Those are my babies. I love them to death. And they live in Amarillo. And I'm not going to tell you too much about their home life. So that way, you know, this is their business, not mine. <laughs> Even though I was there and I was involved, it's not my business to tell their business. So I'm not going to tell you who they are. But I got invited by them to their house. Uh, the two of them and another one of their friends was there. And we were all drinking. It was like a BYOB thing. But I also brought stuff because I, you know, I don't know. I'm one of those people. If I get invited, if I get invited to a party, I'm bringing something, you know. So I bring like uh, two bottles I think one of them is a New Amsterdam cranberry, wildberry, something like that. And then I bring some beers that I don't even fucking drink because <laughs> I don't drink beer. And <laughs> because beer is what I drank that night that, uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you all about that story. Oh, I'm going to have to tell you about the parties that I've ever been to, which will be another episode. It'll be drugs too. <laughs> Even though alcohol isn't technically classified as a drug. But it is a drug. Anyway, so I'm at these uh, guys' house. And we are having a good time. We're listening to music. They're smoking their weeds. I am not. <laughs> I am drinking my drinks. They are drinking drinks. They are smoking their weeds. Everything's great. Um, we are singing <laughs> shallow, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, um, we're, we're singing, we're, we're just completely random. We're doing all kinds of stupid shit and uh, we're listening to like Spotify. We're putting a playlist together. Shallow comes on where me and one of the boys are talking about how we, how we sing well. And, you know, we start singing shallow. I let him sing Lady Gaga's part. I take Bradley Cooper's part, which it turns out made one of the other guys that we were there with horny. <laughs> and he was dead set on sleeping with me that whole night, which wasn't going to be successful considering how the rest of the story pans out. He's a cutie though. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, um, you know, we're having fun. And then one of the two boys is like, Hey, do you mind if we get some cocaine? And I was like, <sighs> like I really had to think my life through. And then I, <laughs> I heard a little voice in my head that was like, come on, mom said, try everything once <laughs> because my mother smoked marijuana until she found out she was pregnant with me. And she found out she was pregnant with me like six months into me already existing as a fetus. <laughs> <laughs> so she told me, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and tell you that you can't do drugs. Just try everything once, figure out what you don't like about it, and then move on. <laughs> Which is what's guided my, you know, I guess my uh, 
life decisions to not <laughs> do dr certain drugs anymore because I can't handle them. Apparently, you know, all that marijuana I was exposed to as a fetus just made me hella allergic to it or something. <laughs> My body built some sort of weird survival mechanism next time that merit iguanas ever entered my system i would die <laughs> anyway so the guys are like you know is it cool if we get some cocaine and i told them uh like two two minutes worth of thinking is done in my head in the <laughs> in the time span of two seconds in real life and i tell them yeah sure i've never tried it before and they were like Oh, this is going to be great. They get a hold of their people. Their people bring the cocaines. And <laughs> kind of like that Dewey Cox movie where he's like, uh, goes to the restroom and he's like, what are y'all doing in here? And that African-American guy's like, get out of here, Dewey. You ain't want no part of this shit. It was kind of like that. <laughs> it was kind of like that in that moment because I saw them getting it already. And, you know, they took their hits. They, you know, they were, you know, they both participated. One of the other friends, there was four of us, two of my friends, and then one of their friends, and who would eventually become my friend, which is the one that wanted to sleep with me. <laughs> and, you know, they're all doing cocaine, and then I'm fi I finally muscled up the courage to to try a little, a little bump. And, you know... <sighs> I don't have cocaine nails. I've never done the cocaines before. I've never done, you know, I've never done anything harder than married iguanas. And then I only tried that twice because it tried killing me both times. So, you know, they're, they put out lines or whatever. And it's my turn to take my line or to do my line or whatever, however the fuck you say it. <laughs> and... You know, they get my line together for me and that are like, that one's yours. They say, that one's yours. And I tell them, half of that. <laughs> they cut it in half. <laughs> and then I tell them, half of that. <laughs> they cut it in half again. I tell them, half of that. And this was like a year ago. Like, this wasn't very long ago. And so I tell them like 20 times, half of that, half of that, half of that. And then finally, one of them gets the one cutting the lines gets so agitated. He's like, if I half it one more time, it's not going to, you're not even going to notice it's there. And at this point, it's not even, not even, <laughs> I can't even explain. It looks like, <laughs> it looks like a faint line of dust, <laughs> like a faint line of uh, of dust on a bookshelf that you've read from recently, but not too recently. And so kind of, <laughs> I, I would consider this line half of a half of a half of a half of a half of those little tiny bumps you see them doing in the, in the TV shows or the movies. So I, you know, I snort that. I don't feel a goddamn thing. I don't even notice that I've done anything. And they're like, how do you feel? And I was like, I feel like a person. Like, I don't, I can't tell the difference right now. And they're like, hmm, maybe you didn't take enough. And I said, well, I'm not doing any more until I figure out what this does to me. Because every time I say I can't feel anything, I start dying. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and they're like, do you feel like a little drip in the back of your, in, in the back of your throat? Like, what, what do you feel? And I was like, I don't feel any different than I did before. Famous last words. <laughs> um, they're like, okay, well, they finished the cocaine. I mind my fucking business, and I'm drinking my drink. And <laughs> I kind of flash back for two split seconds to the first time I tried the married iguanas. And I'm sitting in the guy's house, <laughs> in my friend's house, <laughs> And very similar to my first instance with pot, I tell them both, oh, I'm going to use the restroom real quick. <laughs> I start throwing up again. I start throwing up. 
Uh, my body's rejecting it. My body said, no, ma'am, Mama Ray's a survivor. We're not going down like this. <laughs> and starts purging my entire system from everything. And I'm in their restroom for another 15, 20 minutes. And every every now and again, I'll leave their restroom. And then I'll, 30 seconds, leave the restroom, be out of the restroom, trying to rejoin society <laughs> and normal life. And then I have to go back to the restroom again because of the nausea. And the boys' vibe is completely killed. Like, I feel terrible <laughs> because I've completely ruined the vibe by throwing my whole guts out. And so they're putting up. They're, you know, the party is over. Not because of me, but because it was about that time anyway. <laughs> and, you know, they're cleaning up. I'm trying to help. But every two seconds, I'm going back to the restroom to throw up. Finally, in... <laughs> in a flashback to, you know, 2015 New Year's Eve party, I end up on their floor <laughs> crying, <laughs> nauseous, and I start singing Shallow. <laughs> and I'm hitting all the notes. <laughs> and I tell myself, <laughs> the drugs aren't your thing, boo. <laughs> like, the, <laughs> you're not one of... The, those people, I guess, that could handle drugs, <laughs> and it was on the floor that day that I'd, st in the restroom at these other friends' houses that I decided I was not going, at these other friends' house that I decided I was not ever going to do any kind of drugs ever. I knew what my vices were, I smoke, <laughs> and I drink, and that's it. <laughs> I end up having, you know, to sleep in their guest room. Their other friend is <laughs> ends up falling asleep next to me while also helping me get me into the room. He, he puts a trash can, gives me a toothbrush, gives me a wet rag, gives me a towel, sets everything up. I fall asleep, and I can tell he's flirting with me and stuff like that, but I'm like... When I'm not feeling well, I'm I'm not considerate to other people. <laughs> I'm not like I'm worrying about my own self, <laughs> my own survival at this point. And you know he's, do you need anything? And I'm like, I'm fine, thank you, thank you, I'm fine, thank you. And he's like, do you need this? Do you need that? And I really want to tell him to shut up and leave me alone for two seconds. I'm try I'm, I'm trying not to die, but I don't. <laughs> and I'm just I'm just not in the mood. Anyway, I wake up <laughs> after falling asleep. He's sleeping next to me with his whole ass pressed against my body. And very respectfully, because I am a gentleman, I, you know, scooch away from him and I, and I go back to sleep, wake up, you know, he's pressed his body against me again. And I'm not feeling any better just because I've had a few hours of sleep and the sun's up. <laughs> I'm not feeling any kinds of better, actually. I'm still feeling disgusting. <laughs> Probably 75% of what I was feeling at this point when I wake up. And, uh, you know, I go back to bed. It's finally like 11 o'clock of me in and out of sleep. And I hear someone in the house. So I know that one of the boys is woken up. I go out. <laughs> into the living room and one of the boys who does not do cocaine as often as the other boy is saying oh I never do it I always end up feeling like shit afterwards and I was like oh so this is normal and he's like well what do you feel like and I was like I feel like 75% of the way I did when I went to bed and he's like no that's not normal <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that according to all of the TV shows, the cocaine is supposed to sober you up a little bit. It did not. I thought I was dying. So I was like, well, I'm broken. I just can't do any of the drugs, I guess. And that's my drug story. <laughs> I can't do drugs, I guess. I don't know. I um have zero tolerance for for the weeds and the cocaines, <laughs> I never, ever in my whole ever life try anything harder than that because, no, no, I'm, 
I'm no, <laughs> never, ever, 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 never. And people say never try and never say never, 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 never. My whole life ever. I can't even try the canes. Like I can't even do the pots. What the hell makes you think that shooting up a load of heroin is gonna do anything better for me? No, I I think that. I think that my body has just decided that it doesn't like not being in control. It doesn't like being at a hundred. It doesn't like the feeling of anything other than what it's used to. And what it's used to is alcohol. (laughs) It's used to alcohol. It can process alcohol like a son of a bitch, but the weeds and the cocaines are a completely different story. Now, I never smoke marijuana again, but I have been really interested in trying edibles like those gummies or pop brownies or something like that. But some people say that that stuff is even worse. (laughs) It's even stronger. It's even more potent, especially edibles, because they are in your system for longer in different periods. I I don't know. I I don't know. I, I stopped trying to pay attention to it. When I noticed it was killing me both times. <laughs> but I am interested in at least trying one or the other. Anyway, I am interested in, in trying edibles. <laughs> in Eventually. No time soon, because I haven't found the courage to do so yet. But one of these days, I'm sure, after I'm completely certain that I won't die. <laughs> and then if I ever do, I, I'm only going to eat like... Half of a half of a half of whatever they give me. So if it's one of those gummy bears, half of a half of a half of the gummy bear. And if it's a pot brownie, like one half of a square inch of the brownie (laughs) is, is it for me. And then there's that. And what other drugs have I wanted to try? I've always wanted to try like acid or shrooms or something like that. But I'm also afraid in similar... In similar fashion to marijuana, (laughs) that I will not have a very good time with those. (laughs) And I'm kind of messed up mentally and psychologically, so I know that if I tripped, it wouldn't go out for me. And yeah, that's my experience with drugs. Um, Y'all hit me up and tell me about y'all's experiences with drugs. I want to know if y'all think that I'm just doing it wrong. (laughs) Y'all let me know. Comments. Oh, maybe don't rat yourself out. Y'all let me know through Snap, Facebook Messenger. (laughs) DM me on Instagram. (laughs) Tweet me. Direct tweet. Uh, Yeah, let me know if I'm doing something wrong. (laughs) Now that I think about it, I was already drinking when I tried the cocaines for the first time and the first time I tried the married iguanas I was already drinking so maybe I just can't do both but the second time I hadn't uh, the second time I tried the married iguanas I hadn't had anything at all and I I still got sick I don't know anyway y'all let me know if I'm doing anything wrong and (laughs) I might almost sort of kind of maybe think about trying an edible someday. And finally, make sure you vote. I'm not going to explain why. You should know by now. It is our only civic duty as American citizens. It is our only responsibility. Paying taxes, voting, jury duty. That's it. Those three things, and you get to enjoy all of the opportunities that this country has to to offer. And it really is, guys, about the survival of the integrity of our nation. And just make sure that y'all make educated votes and y'all get out and show up. And let's not have a repeat of 2016 because hashtagging on Twitter might work for American Idol, but the U.S., the the federal government doesn't give two fucks about your tweet. Get to a polling place and make sure that your voice is heard. Okay, bye. 
With that being said, we've officially made it to the end of Ask Fonzie Anything. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this entire episode. If you want to hear more, I have tons of episodes posted already, and I'll post new episodes whenever I want. No, but seriously though, usually Mondays, and when the show starts growing, I'll start releasing episodes twice a week or something. If you like the show, it is available almost everywhere podcasts can be heard, including Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Make sure you add, like, subscribe, or follow me on my social media profiles. It's at Fonzie Graziano on everything, so you don't have to worry about missing an episode. Make sure and send me DMs to request episode discussion topics. You can write in to me if you need advice. I've been told I'm an infinite spring of wisdom. I can definitely give you an outside perspective. I'll tell you what I would do anyway. And who knows, your letter might be the one I answer in the next episode. Uh, if you like, you can directly support the podcast. There are links in the bio to my Patreon and Anchor Direct. Or you can just buy one of my books. My first book, Glory, is available in print on Amazon.com and Walmart.com. The ebook is available on Kindle. And there is an audiobook available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes.com, I think. But don't quote me on that. Also, my second book, A Raindrops and Other Lullabies, which was originally due for release earlier this year, but it's been pushed back twice due to the coronavirus. It'll definitely be out before the end of the year, though. Uh, if you go to my website, not only can you download and read PDF previews of both books, but you can also listen to a sample of the audiobook of Glory, and if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get an exclusive updates on what I'm working on and promo codes and sales and discount info. And last but not least, I just want to remind y'all to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud, be kind to yourself and others, unless they talk to you crazy, and wash your fucking hands and wear your goddamn mask. I want to go to the bar. We'll get through this together. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I think you're pretty cool. I don't care what they say about you. Bye.